what's your what does your music sound like because i'm getting like a hundred emails a day and yeah. i i have like i'm like radar looking for like oh okay virgin river like i'm looking for acoustic yes. indie pop right um or like you know the occasional dramatic song uh when i worked on shadow hunters we mm -hmm. used a lot of electronic based music so if that was like a keyword it would catch my eye mm. um not looking for anything using hip-hop right now although mm -hmm. when warrior nun comes up i might be like warrior nun is a very international show and we like to use music from around the country too. so oh cool. uh spanish artist with spanish lyrics like super cool mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um so I have kind of like little buzzwords in my head. So it helps mm. me if you can tell me a little bit what your sound is, or if you want to reference a band, mm -hmm. um, you know, or a couple of bands that you might be similar to. That's actually, I know people don't like to be put in a box, but it's actually really helpful when you're trying to get somebody's attention. What's going on? Welcome to the New Music Business Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business. Today, my guest, I am so excited, is Lindsay Wolfington. She is a music supervisor, and she's known for her work on, uh, most famously, initially, she broke out as a music supervisor for One Tree Hill. I feel very closely connected to the show because this was one of my first massive, massive placements, which changed the trajectory of my career once my song got placed on the show. I tell the story of how that all went down, and Lindsay and I chat about that a little bit and what came from that placement she also works on virgin river fear street warrior nun all on netflix she did the movie and has won awards for her music that she placed into all the boys i've loved before and the sequel to all the boys p.s i still love you on netflix she works on hulu shows like dark and a feather she works on The Village. She did Shadowhunters, and she did The Royals on E. Her list is honestly endless. Uh, she is an absolute superstar in the music supervision world, and I'm so excited to have her on the show. We had such a great conversation. Uh, stick around to the very end because we brought in Ari's Take Academy students who are part of our Advanced Sync Strategies course to ask questions at the end. And some of them asked some really excellent questions that you're going to want to stick around for. Uh, namely, how do we get my covers placed? Not mine, but like somebody's covers placed in shows and what it is. Uh, Lindsay gave an excellent tip on how you can get cover songs placed in shows. So stick around to the end for that. As always, please find us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. We are there at Ari's Take. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Ari Herstand. As always, please visit the website, ariestake.com. Sign up on the email list. That's how you're going to be notified about future episodes and what's happening in the new music business. We're posting company reviews, company comparisons. We just posted an admin publisher's comparison and keeping our digital distributor comparison updated. So visit ariestake.com. Get on that email list. And please like, subscribe, subscribe. Follow, however you're listening to the show right now, please hit that follow button, like that button, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review if you'd be so kind. That really helps. If you're listening on YouTube, leave a leave a note in the comments and we'll say what up. All right, let's kick into the show. Lindsay Wolfington, welcome to the show. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Um, and first off, another congratulations because uh, Billboard and TuneFind came out uh, in December and listed Virgin River as the number one TV show, new TV show for Sync, and and your movie, uh, the the sequel uh, to All the Boys, also as in the top five best new movies for Sync as well. So congratulations on that. That's so so yeah, cool. Yeah, that's awesome. It's kind of cool that Billboard is recognizing that stuff now. Um, yeah, I feel like music supervision is something that at least when I was kind of getting started in music was so elusive. I didn't really know that that was a thing. Um, it's funny. Ari's take has just uh, got on. We, I just got on TikTok and I we've just been like doing some TikTok stuff. And I like 
uh, put out a TikTok, very quick 30 second video of just like, you know, here's who places music on TV shows. They're called music supervisors. And here's how you can find their name. And like, what, you know, don't stop the credits. And you should recognize these people because these are the, this is why you love the music. And like that TikTok went viral because people are like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that there was somebody who placed music. And like, that's actually someone's job. How do I become a music supervisor? That's the best job in the world. So it's like really great that finally music supervisors uh, you know, are getting that recognition. I love that you have the Guild of Music Supervisor Awards, which you've been a recipient of. Um, and so actually, let's start there because the Guild of Music Supervisors, you're part of, you're on the, is, are you on the board? I'm on officially? the board, yes. Let's talk this about that fancy. because, <laughs> yeah, what is the Guild of Music Supervisors and what do you guys do? And uh, yeah, what's it all about? So we're a group of volunteers. It's an entirely volunteer uh, run group. And mm -hmm. we basically adv advocate for the craft of music supervision, um, mm -hmm. the craft of putting music to media because you know I mainly work in film and television, but there are music supervisors in ads in trailers mm -hmm. in video games um, and also in house. Uh, mm -hmm. But basically, you know, it's one, it's great to have a community of support um, you know, there's no handbook for this job. You know, right. people have tried to write books, but like you can't read a book and do the job. So yeah. um, it's good to have a community that you can turn to with questions. It's good to have mm. a community who can look into, you know, is it worthwhile to get health insurance benefits through a guild, um, mm. through coming together and getting something like that. So literally, you know, we sure. have a lot of committees that you can be involved on. Um, one of the heads of the education committee. Mm -hmm. So we actually have our education conference coming up on February 18th and 19th. Cool. Um, and it's gonna be virtual this year. So we've made it free exclusively to our members and friends mm. of the guild. Um, mm -hmm. And friends of the guild could literally be like anyone interested in the craft. Um, cool. And then members have to go through like, they get vetted for different tiers of membership. But um, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So we're just the trying to like expand our community and also like the guild has been able to say, hey, Emmys, like music yeah. really helps your TV shows, doesn't it? And they're like, yeah. yeah, you're right. So now there's an Emmy Award for music supervisors and oh, wow. there's a Grammy. Yeah, there's a, yeah. Um, oh my gosh. That's awesome. When did oh, that happen? I didn't, that. No, I didn't know that. It's so cool. It's happened for four years. So, okay. um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the supervisor who did Big Little Lies. But she won the very first one. Okay. Um, and then uh, Miss Maisel won the next three. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> Hard to nice. top, you know, that in terms of. Right, like, right. Yeah, those are monster music, shows, so. of course. Yeah. Um, and was it Susan Jacobs? Did, did, uh, yes, thank you. Susan did, Jacobs. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's right. That's right. Um, so. Yeah, it's so cool, and that's great that that there's the Emmys and the, and the Grammys now for you guys. Um, I love. I tuned into a panel. Um, uh, Guild of Music Supervisors hosted with actually our uh instructor for a sync licensing course as part of our East Tech Academy of uh, Vo Williams. He was a panelist. Oh, yeah. Um, not too long ago, and it was so good. And AG was on the panel, and I've been I her, her band, the Rescues, and I. We used to play shows together back in the day, and we toured together. And so it was like cool to hear how how AG has evolved and is now like this this um, incredible uh, producer, getting like syncs left and right, and and just kind of how um, you know the approach that that artists and producers look at the sync realm. Uh, and how they work with their agencies or their their licensing companies and uh, music supervisors directly. So in your words, because I, I know that there's probably a lot of people listening uh, to this right now who may not necessarily be familiar with what a music supervisor does or what that all entails other than just like picking the dope songs that get placed on the shows. Can you break it down a little bit in your words? Yeah, yeah. Um... I'll try to be as concise as possible, but basically a music supervisor is responsible for all music elements in a project. Mm -hmm. um, in that when we read a script, if someone quotes a lyric, if there's a song written in, um, maybe someone plays a song and shows an album cover or puts the vinyl on a record player. That's, oh wow. those are things like we look out for, you know, obviously sure. if 
there is a dance, you know, if, is there a cheerleading squad who's doing a dance routine? We need to help find a song um, for the choreographer to work with. So, you know, you're looking, you're helping with all elements that it uh, affect production. So when I say production, I mean, you know, like you got to film it, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, so you need to have it, anything cleared and decided on before filming, if it's essentially part of the dialogue or flow of the show. Mm -hmm. And then you also work in post-production, which is, hey, that bar needs a cue. Let's send over some music. Hey, this is the first time these characters kiss. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we want a song there. Is there going to be an end montage? Um, cool. I say that because like when I look through scripts, not only am I looking for written in visual vocals, which means someone singing or uh, dances or anything that will be filmed. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm also always looking for moments so that I can get an editor music really early on um, mm. to try to put in the piece. We are also sometimes involved in helping pick composers. We are oh. also sometimes asked to temp score, especially mm -hmm. when a show is new, like you don't know what the show is going to sound like yet. So yeah. you got to try some different things. Um, mm -hmm. And we can help by either sending over temp scores. Sometimes people want to use a ton of music or want to mm -hmm. be inspired by a particular sound of music. Um, well, let's, I want to, I want to jump in there for a second because uh, with Virgin River specifically, um, there is such a, a sound to that show. I mean, it's, it's very acoustic, it's very folky. Um, and the score is mostly acoustic guitars. Um, yeah. What was that process like when were you brought in to the, the process and then when was, and who is the composer and when were they brought in and how closely do you work with, with the composer? For so the, the composer the is Jeff Garber. He's awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. That show I was actually, Jeff was hired before me. Okay. Um, so I was actually brought in on episode three. Uh, um, and so they had Jeff and Jeff actually recommended me. So cool. <laughs> composers cool. can help <laughs> me get jobs too. And I had cool. actually worked on a Christmas film with him the year before for Freeform, um, nice. which was No Sleep Till Christmas. And Jeff is like a guy who used to be in a, oh, and Jeff was actually also a co-composer on the Royals with Sid Coastal. Oh, which you also did. So, yeah, yeah. Yes. So mm -hmm. Sid is known for This Is Us. Um, cool. he, he's been nominated for an Emmy for that show and which is also an acoustic score. So, mm. um, Sid and Jeff have worked together and also have the same agent. So I don't know how Jeff got hired, but I think there was some thought of like, yeah. oh, acoustic score and, um, Sid, I don't know if Sid was involved. Yeah. So I don't know if they went to Sid and recommended Jeff or like what, but yeah. Jeff's like perfect for it, but Jeff's like a yeah. band guy, right? He used to be like a guitarist in a band. They're literally cool. songs on extreme music, like band songs that are mm -hmm. his. Um, mm. So if you're <laughs> looking for a score that's going to be based on guitar, he's a really yeah. good guy to go Jeff's to. The like guy. the Christmas film we did together was more like electric guitar based. Mm. Um, but definitely, cool. you know, Virgin River kind of the visuals inform the sound. You're kind of like, oh, mm. we're in this beautiful, rustic, Northern California town. It kind of like, I think everybody's first instinct is like, yeah, acoustic guitar, right? Right, right, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like even the songs, I was like, oh yeah, I know what this sounds like. Yeah, um, yeah, no, that, and, and it's so clear. And, and there's been a lot of recognition uh, because uh, for the show's soundtrack and, and because it, fits such a vibe like uh marie claire magazine they came out and they and they said uh the virgin rivers season two soundtrack is a near perfect folk pop playlist which is so cool and they listed all the songs from season two and they're like just cue this up it's good you're gonna love it um and i started i was listening to uh it down a bit and it's like oh yeah the, this feels like a perfect soundtrack um which i think uh, a lot of people don't necessarily realize that shows have such a tone and they, you know, especially artists when they're like, man, I, I really want to get my song synced. I want to get my songs on a TV show. Um, it's like the best place to start isn't just like, you know, sending your music to everyone who happens to work in sync, but like finding that show with the right tone. And like this show has such a, a distinct tone. I want to get back to that in a second, but back to the, the jobs of a music supervisor, because I think this is so, there's so many layers to this. You mentioned something about 
clearing and like you do clearing so it's not just like the fun part of picking the right songs and the vibe and the tone and working with the composer which is the glamorous side of it the non not so glamorous side of it is the clearing talk about the process of that a little bit i can't believe i left that out like it's it's <laughs> like 60 percent of the job um yeah so anytime you want to use something you need to get permission to use it um, okay. You are syncing a song to picture. Um, so you need to get approval for, yeah. You know, so I, I teach music supervision, right? So every song there's someone owns the recording and someone owns the song or someone wrote it, someone recorded it. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's the same person, sometimes it's not, but mm -hmm. you have to get a hundred percent of both sides approved to be able to use something. Mm -hmm. Um, and a fee is usually negotiated in that process as well. And so, yeah, a ton of the time is, is doing that because it's, it's, you know, writing in the scene description and how long is the use and, okay, here's our budget. What can we pay everybody mm -hmm. so that we like don't go over? Um, and then sending out that paperwork, getting it back. And then we're, I'm also responsible usually for sending confirmation letters once we know the song's been used mm. and will be in the episode. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so there's this, yeah. And I so actually it, won't pitch a song unless I know how to clear it. Like where, who owns it? Ah, um, that's a because, really good, yeah. Yeah, because if my producer picks it, I want to deliver. I don't mm. I don't want to be sending a song that either gets denied or I'm like, you know what guys, can't actually find the owner of this song. Mm. <clears throat> so, and TV tends to work pretty rapidly, even though mm -hmm we don't air for like six months after we're done sometimes. Sure. Um, it still can be pretty fast paced. So I basically, my I'm responsible to a showrunner or a director, depending on whether it's a TV show or film. Mm -hmm. And I just want them, I just want to give them yes, right? It's a right. bad day when I have to tell them no. So when a song is mm. denied or if a song doesn't clear um, for whatever reason, because I can't find them, uh, yeah. that's a bummer. So it makes sense for kind of these uh, for 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 major artists who are on labels. They probably have publishing deals. They have, they have a label deal um, that there are a lot of people involved in the clearing of uh, those songs. You got to go to the label for who owns the recording. Then you got to go to the publisher. And if there's multiple songwriters, there's multiple publishers you have to clear with. When you're talking about independent artists, um, and because you've placed so many independent artists over the years. Um, I'm curious, what would you advise for artists uh, to do to best set themselves up for success to make your job the easiest it can be so you can get to that yes with your producers and you're not they're not giving you any more headaches? Yeah. So generally speaking, the paperwork I'm sending any inner indie artist mm -hmm. is the same paperwork I'm sending Katy Perry. Um, so sometimes I feel like with indie artists, there's a little bit of like, ah, contract, like, I don't want to be taken advantage of rightfully. So, um, right. what does this mean? Blah, blah, blah. But then the other part of me is like, this is, this is the sheet. It's like from Netflix. I can't change Netflix. So like, you know, this is what it is. Take it or leave right. it. And generally those rights these days are all media excluding theatrical for worldwide rights in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. So that just means, you know, your song can go in a project um, forever and ever, whether that project comes out on DVD or streaming, the only place it can't go if it's a TV show is theatrical. Okay. When you do work on a movie, you get the whole kit and caboodle, including theatrical. Okay. Um, but so, you know, know your, if you've written with anybody, settle your splits, know your splits, know who's involved. Are you going to be signing off on your writer? And you should have a piece, a piece of paperwork saying that you have the right to do that. If you plan mm -hmm. to try to make it a one stop, um, one stop, meaning Ari owns his recording and his publishing. Maybe he co-wrote this one song, but it's 50, 50. And he made a deal with the writer that he can sign off on him. Mm -hmm. And if that writer doesn't, if that writer wants to sign off for himself, that's fine too. Just, you know, the first thing I will be like, okay, um, I often ask, do you own 100% master, 100% publishing? Mm -hmm. And it's okay if the answer is no. I just want to know who the other part is, mm -hmm. right? I'm mm -hmm. hoping it's another unsigned artist so that, yes. you know, it can keep you in the same fee range at least, right? Because I generally mm -hmm. like pitch in kind of fee ranges. 
if I've pitched you for a spot that only has a thousand dollars and then later down the road you tell me oh right I co-wrote this and my co-writer is with Universal Music Publishing well now I'm up a creek because they're not going to be cool with 500 aside Uh Um, so those are the situations I'm trying to avoid Um, and it's fine if you wrote with a big writer I just Mm -hmm. need to know that up front so that I don't pitch you for the background of a bar that only has a thousand bucks so when an artist is sending you uh, what, maybe if you get in touch with the artist, you found their song somewhere and you want to use it, or the artist uh, is pitching you directly because they did their research and they found it's like, wow, Virgin River would be the perfect show for for my new folk pop song. Um, to upfront say I own a hundred, or just at least I own a hundred percent of both sides, or uh, you know, lay out who owns what with contact information is probably a good way to get uh, to start that open that conversation, maybe. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing um, that you want to say is what's your, what does your music sound like? Because I'm getting like a hundred emails a day and I I have like, I'm like radar looking for like, Oh, okay. Virgin river. Like I'm looking for acoustic indie pop. Right. Um, Or like, you know, the occasional dramatic song. Uh, When I worked on shadow hunters, we Mm -hmm. used a lot of electronic based music. So if that was like a keyword, it would catch my eye. Mm. Um, not looking for anything using hip hop right now. Although mm-hmm. when Warrior Nun comes up, I might be like Warrior Nun is a very international show and we like to use music from around the country too. So, oh, cool. uh, Spanish artist with Spanish lyrics, like super cool, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I have kind of like little buzzwords in my head. So it helps mm. me if you can tell me a little bit what your sound is or if you want to reference a band, mm-hmm. um, you know, or a couple of bands that you might be similar to. That's actually, I know people don't like to be put in a box, but it's actually really helpful when you're trying to get somebody's attention. Uh, it, it, I mean, you're probably moving, you said you get so many pitches and you're moving quickly. And if I put in the subject line, um, sounds like the Weepies and Gregory Allen Iskov, you're like, oh, wow, they're both right. in, in um, the show I'm Virgin working River. on right now in Virgin River. And, and like, I could use them right now. So perfect, you know, and then that's probably an easy end. Now, where do you land on um, how you want to receive the music? Do you like disco playlists? Do you prefer Dropbox? Like, what do you what do you prefer personally? I just like a place where I can both stream and download. Um, I know there are supervisors out there supposedly Mm -hmm. who only like streaming links. I Mm -hmm. don't, for me, that's frustrating because if I like a song, I need the MP3 because that's, Mm -hmm. I need to send the editor an MP3. Um, so if I like a song, I want to be able to download it now. Um, I don't want to have to write you and ask you for a download. Um, because I, and then if I don't get a chance to write you, I may just forget about it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So, sure. um, so disco is great. Dropbox is great. Uh, box is great. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, high is like fine, but I can't listen in advance. So if I don't mm. know your music in advance, it helps me to be able to like sample something. I'm probably not going gotcha. to download it if I don't know what it sounds like. Got it. Got it. So it's streaming and download. So box, disco, Dropbox, that kind of a thing. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and, and no, and, and I, I, I have to tell the funny anecdote of, uh, when you say that you want to download it, you, and you need it quick, but you may not need it for months. Like, um, you know, when, uh, how we first met, uh, you tweeted one day and this was, this was 2009, I think, uh, 2009, 2010. And you're like, uh, man, it's so hard to fit all this great music into my budget for One Tree Hill. And I tweeted back to you. I'm like, here's a freebie. And I linked you to uh, one of my songs that I thought would work for the show. I linked you to the MP3. And we like tweeted back and forth a little bit and exchanged emails. And you're like, oh, cool. And you actually tweeted back to me like five minutes later. You happen to listen to it right there. And you're like, oh, I love it. And then you, I guess, downloaded it, saved it. And then five months later... (laughs) <laughs> no, I didn't hear anything. And then five months later, you sent me an email. It was like, hey, uh, we want to use this song in Tuesday's episode. I need the contract back by 5 p.m. today. I'm like, oh, my gosh, like five months of nothing. And then, like, I have five hours. And and But it was like – it was such an incredible moment for me because I'm like, oh, my gosh, this worked. And that – I mean, One Tree Hill at the time, just like it was career-altering for 
for all the artists that got placed on the show. I mean, like literally for three years after that placement, I had people come up to me at every show saying that they discovered me from One Tree Hill. And not to mention that night, like my iTunes sales skyrocketed. uh, And it was like, it was, it was unbelievable. Like it literally changed the trajectory of my career, that one placement, not to mention it was like three and a half mi- minutes of the, the the entire song got placed. It spanned over four scenes. It was like the most magical moment uh, that I've had. And mm-hmm. I like still tell the story even 10 years later because it was like my first big placement. And it was uh, and it just like completely altered my entire career. And so for one, thank you for that. And two, that just like, you know, goes to show that like, yeah, it's it's like wait a long time and then boom, I mean, need it today kind of a thing. So basically what happens is I download it and it goes into, I have like folders, right? So I have an emotional folder, an upbeat folder, maybe a quirky or playful folder, depending on what's going on on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, so you went into the emotional folder basically. And then mm-hmm. we just had to wait for the right moment. <laughs> <laughs> and that happens with like anybody that happens with yeah. Lizzo. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, yeah, just you got so to wait. It has to be the right moment. You can't, you know, put a square peg in a round hole. Totally. Totally. So, so speaking of Lizzo, um, you placed Lizzo in Virgin river, um, and Hozier and, you know, some of these, these, and, and Aretha Franklin, not to mention, um, I mean, <laughs> right. So I'm assuming that the, the, uh, what Netflix was able to pay for Aretha Hozier and Lizzo is quite different than maybe what you paid for some of these other artists. And also I noticed that you use quite a bit of music library music, like extreme. I, I noticed when I was looking up in TuneFind, um, all the songs that you've placed, there are quite a few songs that um, you got from Extreme Music, which is just a music library, which I know. And, and so I, I'm curious the range and how all that works. Uh, does Netflix say, all right, you have X amount to spend per episode, per season? And then how do you put the puzzle together? Yeah, so there is an episodic budget. Every TV show has an episodic budget. And most okay. of them, Virgin River included, just wants me to zero out by the end of the 10 episodes, right? So we can use a ton in episode one, knowing that episode three only needs two bar cues. Um, And all that, those extreme music cues are because we have a bar, we're in a bar. Jack, Mm. who is one of the main characters is a bar. We're in there sometimes five to six times an episode. Sometimes you can hear the song. Most times it's really just vibe. So Mm -hmm. we don't spend our money there. So generally most of the stuff in the bar is around a thousand dollars. And then libraries like Extreme sometimes have preset fees with studios. So you don't have to negotiate it. You know, it's going to be $800 or whatever the fee is. Mm -hmm. Um, And every, and some studios even make like overall deals with libraries where you can use their music for free. And then I basically want to save our money for our big moments. Um, Mm. Virgin River happens to be a show where if they save on production, they will give money to the music budget. Cool. Hence Aretha Franklin. Um, (laughs) But they knew, you know, Hope and Doc are, you know, of an older generation. So they really wanted to be able to use like something, a song she would really love. And they they felt like Aretha was her vibe. Um, And it was essentially a proposal scene. So that was an mm-hmm. important moment to them. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so with, with the, um, with the budget, when you were talking, uh, cause I've, I've heard and, and, you know, I don't know how much you're able to reveal. I've seen some of the Netflix contracts it, and I've seen like a, around $10,000 for like an indie artist, uh, all in placement. Is that, is that a, about accurate or is the range quite different for like a total indie artist that's not with a label that's not with a publisher? No, I would say 10,000 is an amazing deal if you have no one attached to you. Um, okay. I will almost never pay that for someone who doesn't have a pub deal or some sort of, because I can license a song for 5,000 aside from a major label. If they have an up and coming mm. artist they're trying to push, um, you know, hasn't broken yet. Like, mm-hmm. That's low for them, 
but right. it's doable. And just to um, just to clarify, when you say aside, you're saying five thousand aside. That means five thousand for the master side and five thousand for the publishing side. So all in, yes. that's ten thousand. But because you have to negotiate with the record label and the publisher, that's why you say aside five thousand yes. per each side. Okay, just wanted to clarify exactly. that. Exactly. Thank you. I know um, we say it all the time, and maybe it's easier to refer as whole numbers. Um, yeah. Every show you work on, work on is different. Most people just want to know the whole number. They're like, how much right. is it going to cost? Yeah, yeah. So I generally, you know, I mean, really every project's different. I've worked on, I'm currently on a, uh, a show for Nickelodeon that uh -huh. is 2,500 an episode. I actually probably should be saying that out loud. Wow. Total, okay. Right. <laughs> so like, you know, yeah. now Viacom sure. has um, a, a library of songs they have pre-approved or deals with um so you can afford that uh mm -hmm. but yeah that's nothing right and i previously worked on another one that had four thousand. i work on a regular series that is actually almost like a movie that is 10 or under so mm -hmm. i'm using things that are a thousand maybe like two thousands like top dollar on the show sure. um yeah and then you get more like and Virgin River actually started off uh, with a really tight budget. Um, as they realized music was important, they actually put more money in it for the following season. Cool. Um, so season so one, you... like you'll know, like we have like an episode with a dance and we have like 12 songs and they're all, so I would say an indie rate for yeah. an unsigned artist is generally between one and 3K, sometimes okay. up to 5K gotcha. total. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then occasionally, you know, I guess shows exist where other supervisors or they have like a ton of money and the indie artist is the only song in the thing. So maybe mm. 10,000 is normal. Um, but, you know, it's the range is what, like, a, it can be like 500 to like 50,000 if you're. Yes. Either. And, and I've seen that. And, and I, I, um, is there a, because you've worked on network, you've worked on Netflix, Hulu. Uh, is there much of a differentiator anymore between network and like an ABC, NBC kind of network versus an, a Netflix or a Hulu in what the upfront fees are looking like? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, but then it also depends on the show. So okay. like Virgin River on Netflix, produced by Net, but it's a Netflix co-production, mm. which means it's their lower budget uh, version of series. So with lower production budgets comes lower music budgets. So even, mm. you know, and we get this feedback from like label, they're like, well, you're Netflix. Well, I'm like, well, like to all the boys, everybody's like, well, it's Netflix. I'm like, yeah. well, actually it's awesomeness. Uh. Um, the first film was made from Awesomeness TV, which was an independent, film company and um was a super indie budget mm. uh the only song that got you know, i don't want to talk about fees but like nobody got a big fee except tears for fears mm. and we needed an 80s song that because there was like a storyline plot it went with sure. right um second film everyone's like well your film did so well surely you have a ton more money <laughs> And it's like, well, not really. And then everybody else is like, it's Netflix. I'm like, well, it's not Netflix. Uh, it's actually Ace. Um, but but they also like made us get more, th they added theatrical rights to what we were getting. So like, while they did give us a little bit more money, they also added rights. So they kind of canceled each other out. Mm. And then they used, the first film used 19 songs. The second film used 32 songs. And film three that's coming out used 47 songs. Wow. So like, um, Anyway, we ended up getting into a soundtrack agreement, which also helps um, the music budget in varied ways. Soundtrack agreements mm -hmm. can be are all over the place in how they're arranged. But um, yeah, you know, but anyway, so just like yeah. what you see is not always what's happening. And I'm definitely a music supervisor who if I have it, I will give mm -hmm. it. I'm not going to. But no, that I, makes I sense. don't ever work on like the massive, I guess the village. And actually One Tree Hill in retrospect, but yeah. at the time I was always still trying to like figure out the budget on One Tree Hill because we just used so much music. It went so fast. Right. Um, but music budgets are not really what they were then. But so I will mm. say The Village, NBC for NBC. NBC is a big network. They sure. tend to uh, 
have better budgets than okay. like the Royals on E, like cable shows, free form, definitely have less. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. And now uh, there has been some controversy, and I'm curious where it is now with the Netflix contracts in that they try to um, – they try to get the artists uh, to give up the rights to their performance royalties, and that had been, and I haven't seen one recently, a staple in the Netflix contract, which was very controversial, to give up your performance rights. And and the, the reasoning behind that is if, if I agree to a contract that says um, that, that I give up my performance rights – then Netflix can, when they are negotiating their blanket licenses with the PROs, with the performing rights organizations, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, all the rest, at the end of the year, they can show a cue sheet and say, like, actually, all of these songwriters, even though, yes, they're with you, they gave up their their rights because they own their music and they gave up their rights. So we don't actually have to put this into the negotiating uh, cue sheets that we're negotiating a lower fee for. Um, so our blanket license can be a lot less. And so then, but then that songwriter, that artist is never going to see another dime from that placement. Whereas like, you know, sometimes, uh, that's a reason that an artist might take a lower payment up front because they'll get much more back end royalties down the line from their PRO. So one, is that stipulation still a, a, a standard in the Netflix contract? And two, what do you feel about it? Well, I think it's not phrased exactly right because it's really a buyout. So they're offering okay. you money up front in exchange for the money you might receive later. Okay. Through through an ASCAP or BMI, right? Uh -huh. So uh, anyway, it's still on the quote requests. Um, mm. Plenty of people don't sign it. So. Meaning they just strike it off and they, they yeah. say, okay. And, and, and that's not a the deal majors, breaker for you? The majors... The majors do not agree to it. Okay. No, it is not a deal breaker. It has been a deal breaker on some shows, I believe, on Facebook. Um, mm. I forget what Facebook's like platform is uh, for content. Facebook Watch. Yeah, face is that what it is? I think so. Uh, yeah, Facebook Watch. I yeah. believe, but um, but they are they cannot use your song unless, or at least there was a point in time where they could not use it without those rights. But okay. there was still a fee for those rights. Okay. Or, I mean, I guess maybe sometimes it was trying to be included in the upfront fees, but that's not what Netflix is doing. So if Netflix was off, you know, say Virgin River wants to use a song, mm -hmm. we've got $3,000. I'm also going to have the language in there if you want to do a buyout for your uh, performance royalties you could quote another 3,000. And maybe 3,000 now is more important to you. I, you know, to be fair, I don't know what you make in songwriting royalties after mm -hmm. the fact. And I don't mm -hmm. know what it would be on a streaming service like Netflix. Mm -hmm. Like, is it a lot? Um, so I'm really like, that's your decision. I don't have any- Is it, it written it, in the contract uh, that it's, uh, it's $3,000 upfront uh, and another three thousand dollars if you want to if you want yeah, us to buy out line. your performance rights. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a separate line. I think that must be a newer thing. Okay, they don't necessarily pick it up right away. They wait till your season's done, and then they review all of those. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and yeah, then they I mean, may or may it, not yeah. exercise it. And the mm -hmm. other thing I would just say is I think it only applies for you your your royalties on that song. So you could go yes. license a different song on a new series and not do it. And that song would get you It's both. just that song on this, for this one usage, yeah. this one instance. Exactly. Right, right. It's, you're not giving them up completely for the for right. the rest of the life of the song. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, $3,000 is, is probably a, a fair buyout. I mean, we don't know, uh, you know, what, how long the show would run, or I guess in the streaming realm, it's so different and no one really knows how, back-end royalties are working in the performance area. And so for a long time, 
very little money has come from Netflix shows in the performance realm that like we've seen on our statements. Um, that may be changing. Hopefully, I mean, ASCAP and BMI, they say they're continuing to negotiate every year and they're, you know, getting better at the reporting. But Netflix notoriously, one of the reasons why they don't pay so well is Netflix keeps all their numbers behind this wall. They don't share their viewership right. numbers with anybody. So whereas like, you know, if you had a show on CBS, those viewership numbers are public. And so then ASCAP can take them. It's like, oh, they they put it through their calculation system and said, okay, 8 million people saw this. It was rerun this many times. It was this. So they had their whole right. calculation like, all right, this will earn you an additional 2000 for this pay period or whatever. Whereas Netflix doesn't share that those numbers. So it's really hard for the PROs to calculate what that is um, after the fact. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's an interesting thing. I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of people in the sync space talk about this and it's a debate as in like what some people will say, like that could be your lottery ticket. Don't ever give up your performance rights. Cause who knows what's going to happen. And maybe you'll get right. paid for the rest of your life because this show is the next Seinfeld. And that is just like, you know, you're keep getting that. So why would you take an additional money on the other side? It's like, well, I mean, we haven't really seen much money from performance royalties and so an additional three thousand up front might be awesome so i don't really have the answer but it's a like an interesting right. thing to know about yeah and i do think three thousand like i'm not sure three thousand is like a regular dsp pickup fee that's probably pretty good mm -hmm. um you know yes. what factors into royalties that you will receive is the length of your use and obviously you know i guess the show and how many people view it but uh um, right so they're probably they're not going to pick up a three thousand dollar option on some so it is an option on um, mm -hmm. something that maybe was only 30 seconds sure Do you know what i mean sure. so you with if, yes. if you are just making that decision i would take into account how long the sync use is mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and make your either the fee you put out there for that option you know yeah according to the length or help that inform your decision um i do think it's a little weird uh i don't i don't see a lot of people exercising it but some people do exercising the accepting the buyout meaning like putting in the option putting in a fee for the option gotcha gotcha sure um so i want to uh shift gears a little bit and when you're um working with um i guess I, i'm curious the process of how you go about finding music and how much you're seeking and how much you're being pitched and the balance of how that works. Like you mentioned earlier, you have folders. So maybe you received a song a year ago and it goes into your uh, acoustic folder, your indie folder, your dream, your electronic or all the folders. So that's, I'm sure, one way. But just on kind of a day-to-day -day basis on when you're getting pitched and what you're seeking out and how that works. Um. So lately I am... Uh, I'm reviewing what submissions come in um, in terms of like reading what it is. Is it something I might be interested in? Um, I also lately have been reaching out to people and saying, and this definitely happens with my lower budget projects. Mm -hmm. um, hey, working on this new project. I only have a thousand aside. Um, so 2000 all in. Mm -hmm. um, we want to use artists specifically from the UK or Europe can you please send me some ideas, mm -hmm. you know, send me emotional upbeat, whatever. So, and then I'll go through a pitch like that. And when you say you're going to people, who are those people? Are these sync yeah. agencies, are these publishing companies? People? Yeah. Who are you going to? <laughs> um, yeah. So they're trusted uh, sync companies, usually third okay. party pitchers um, okay. who know of good indie artists, because, you know, to be fair, I don't have time to go out and find all the great indie artists out there one by one. Right. I do rely on sync agents to help weed, you know, weed them out for me and, you know, help tell me, push me in the right direction for whatever mm. I'm looking for. Um, that's also a little bit of factor of as an independent supervisor to make a living, I have to work on various projects at the same time. So, mm. um, you know, I, right now I'm working on, Virgin River, I'm working on two indie films, I'm working on a documentary that's only clearance, um, I'm working on a kids show for Nickelodeon, I'm and I just got <laughs> hired on a new show, um, 
Laura Webb, who does uh, To All the Boys with me, she and mm-hmm. I are uh, just got hired on Atypical, which is coming back for its last and final season four, also on Netflix. Mm. Uh, gotcha. Wow. So I, I want to get into the uh, the business side of what it's like to be a music supervisor and how you break in in just a second, because there's a we got a lot of questions about that. Um, but just to wrap that uh, side of who you're working with, um, when it comes to uh, the trusted sync agents, like you you call them, and and um, they're trusted in part because most of them are primarily one stops where meaning that they have cleared everything and so you know it's going to be easy you know it's going to be quick they vetted all of the artists and they've brought you quality stuff in the past right yeah and they know the language they're signing off on right so the agreements are going to be easy yeah um when it comes to the difference between these sync agents and music libraries, where does that differentiation come from in your mind when you're seeking music? Um, music libraries, I will more sign on and log into their system and download music. Got um, it. And they are kind of known as like, they're gonna be a certain rate, um, you know, and you can also go to them, you know that they're gonna have a variety of stuff. So maybe if you're on something low budget and you wanna do kind of a blanket, meaning like mm-hmm. I'll pay you $3,000 and I can use as many of your songs as I want, mm-hmm. you know, they might be game for something like that. Gotcha. Um, and and I, I have noticed um, Extreme is one, uh, a music library that you do use a lot for Virgin River. Um, yeah. And they, I mean, Vo Williams, our instructor for the course, he said when he was getting started, he had a lot of his music in uh, I- I- Extreme Music Library. And um, he kind of hacked the system a little bit. And sometimes he'll he'll go under different names or fake artist names or something. He's like, right. I don't want to, I don't want to ruin the brand of, of my artist name, but like this has turned out to be some really great money in the back end for, uh, performance royalties and so that's that's an interesting take and and to be honest like in in doing some of my research i looked up some of the songs that you placed in virgin river that were from extreme and they were by quote unquote fake artists which is the controversy that came out a while ago meaning they're real people but like the artist isn't really developing a traditional artist career like you would necessarily expect they're just like kind of pumping out lots and lots of music for the library. That's exactly when I hear library, it's, it's usually, it's music made to be synced on in Uh media. Mm -hmm. Um, Now I do like, I know I've seen you in, in the groove, Mm -hmm. which is a library I turn to, I refer to them as a library, but I know they represent real indie artists, which sometimes makes a huge difference and really matters to your showrunner. Mm. Um, so I really love companies like that too. Um, I saw you placed Chris Coza, uh, a friend of mine. Yeah. He's also within the groove, and we uh, that the songs that I have within the groove we co-wrote and did together. And then that that album that I released, I gave to In the Groove because also they're Minnesota based, and I was in Minnesota, and we're all kind of friends over there. And so that was a really nice relationship too. I mean, I always think like if I were an artist, like, and I had a couple like songs, maybe they were older, and I wasn't really interested. They weren't. I wasn't really interested in them, but mm-hmm. here, go have them. See if you can make some money off of them. Totally. I can still go do my thing over here. It doesn't yes. have to be exclusive. As I said, like the composer on Virgin River also has songs in extreme music. And yes. and then I've also worked on, you know, the highlight of my career, the World Dog Awards. Um, <laughs> and I was tasked with, you know, doing an overall deal with a library for all the cute to play somebody on stage play somebody off stage and they wanted it to sound like well-produced pop music which happens to be a strength of extreme so we use them on that so and the other the interesting thing is you'll like hear extreme songs in commercials you'll be like wait i know that song and right (laughs) they almost have some familiarity because they're so they're out there so often which can be good or bad Mm -hmm. um Nice. So, um, no, that's, that's great. Uh, when it comes to people who want to become music supervisors, um, now you've had an interesting journey. Uh, you started as a coordinator, um, and, and you, you worked on, 
um, you know, uh, various shows uh, working with music supervisors, and then you kind of went off on your own and, and famously did the sing off. Um, I'm curious, not just necessarily your trajectory of how you got into it, which uh, absolutely please share the story, but also what advice you would give to people who want to get into music supervision themselves? So, you know, I got in before it was cool <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in 2001, uh, but I started as an unpaid intern. Mm -hmm. um, I met with a guy, you know, I, I did acapella in college and ended mm -hmm. up I was reaching out to like anybody alums from my college. I was like, okay, we'll work this network. And none of them knew what music supervision was. And then I happened to reach out to this guy who was alum of my acapella group. He was a studio mm. exec at Disney. And he was like, great, we'll meet for coffee for 20 minutes. And I was like, okay. Um, and I was like, well, what, what do you do? What does a studio exec do? And he said, I oversee TV shows like Alias and Felicity. And I was like, well, Felicity is my dream show. And he huh. oversaw the... Jen and Madonna, who were the music supervisors, and was like your best friend. Madonna Wade Reed, paid intern. Yes, and yes. Jennifer Pikin. Yes. Um, and it legends then in he, the business, right? And then he <laughs> forwarded over yes. my resume, and it was right time, right place. And mm -hmm. then I worked with them for four years. So it's definitely cool. an apprenticeship business if you mm. can get into it. Mm -hmm. um, like I have a coordinator. I part of as an independent supervisor, I can't pay a lot. So part of what I'm offering is like, you're going to get to do everything. You'll get to do creative mm -hmm. and clearance. And I will teach you as much as I know. And I will mm -hmm. give you as much responsibility as I can. Mm -hmm. um, that's obviously an ideal way to learn. I mm -hmm. think, I think, come work sure. for me. I can only <laughs> hire one person. So that's not really a great option. Right. Um, but you know, I think- So does your about, coordinator- you know, does your coordinator uh, work on all the shows or do you have one that's like assigned to you by the network for this one show? I mean, they're all my shows, but she helps okay. on everything. Um, so she's kind of I your assistant. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Um, but you know, like she basically has handled the bar music for season three of Virgin river, you know, awesome. like I don't, she knows what it sounds like. It's going to be inexpensive. Right. go to town like you know how right. to do that go for it yeah. um and then we both still do you know the big moments too um cool. because i think no one can have all the ideas you know mm -hmm. it's better for the show to have two brains working on it mm -hmm. um and as i've seen over time like different coordinators have different uh like tastes and and mm -hmm. strengths um but i do think of our you know i am part of a world of music for media right? So I'm just one part of it. I'm an independent supervisor. There are studios that have music departments that mm -hmm. are either creative or clearance. There are labels and publishers all with sync departments. We there just are had, third uh, party pictures. Yeah, we just had Brian Vickers from Disney on the show. He's a music supervisor at Disney, employed by Disney, works on Disney trailers. So that was yeah. on the sing off. Did you know that about That's him? That's right. Yes, yeah. he was on the sing off. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. Cool. Were you were you a fan at the time or were you working the show when he was actually on it? I was working on the show and when oh, he was so on cool. it. We adored his group. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't each group had like a point person. He wasn't the point person from his group, but I do sure. remember he had so been cool. a coordinator in the field, so like we'd talked about it on set mm -hmm, at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I'm what I'm saying is it's okay. You know, they're trailers, like trailers are often looking for assistant position, like have assistant positions for people who just do cue sheets, which is hard, boring work, but mm -hmm. somebody has mm -hmm. got to do it. And it's actually a great way to see all the layers of things that go into a trailer. So my yes. point is when I'm looking to hire somebody, I'm looking to like, you have a leg up if you've worked in any of these fields already, you know, at a label. Like, so my mm -hmm. coordinator was, a. Uh, Cord was a, an assistant at Capitol Records in the sync department before she came cool. to me. Cool. And my coordinator before that was actually, she had interned with me. She did part-time clearance for Mickey Stern who did mm -hmm. all like season Kent's shows. Um, so she was like an ace at clearance. And then my coordinator before that came from Republic Records. So, okay. you know, just anybody who has 
been in the world has a mm -hmm. leg up from somebody who doesn't. So even if it's okay. not a music supervision job, if it's working for a pitch company, maybe a management company, maybe even a production, you know, like we're, we're sometimes almost more part of the television world than we are the music world. Mm. Um, but just understanding what a master in sync is and, you know, what mm -hmm. fees might be, what, what song work in a scene, you know, sure. having, um, so wherever you can get your foot in the door, cool. um, just start getting that music experience. Love it. Um, cool. That's super helpful. Um, let's take some questions from Ari's Tech Academy students who are in the sync course uh, with Vo uh, as their instructor. Um, I want to bring uh, Sid Bryant. Hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, again, appreciate you uh, doing this Q&A. Um, so do you have any um, advice for uh, if you're trying to pitch music as a as a label as a collective so like you know we you know manage uh, several different artists and we want to pitch pitch them all together um what, what would be your advice uh for handling that type of situation um yeah i mean i do i think that's a great idea um my first instinct is to be like find somebody who's already pitching to help you but um mm -hmm. if you want to take a go at it yourself um I would kind of, you know, if you're going to get someone's attention, give them the music while, while you have them. So, you know, in those, maybe putting together a sampler with a little description about, you know, the four artists that are on there and maybe there are two songs from each artist. Um, mm -hmm. I think that can be a good way to get like a taste of your catalog and, you know, volunteering to work with people's budgets is always helpful, always a foot in the door. <laughs> um, mm. But yeah, does that cool. kind of answer? I'm assuming you're like emailing somebody and what you would put in the email. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we will be, we will be, you know, yeah, reaching out via email, um, you know, and trying to trying to build that relationship from there, uh, you know, with, again, with the artist that, you know, that we have. So um, yeah, that's essentially what I'm looking for. Yeah. And then obviously if you have any connection, you know, or, you know, it's always good to do your research. Hey, saw you used um, Hosier on Virgin River. I have some similar songs. Here you go. Great tip. Great. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Welcome. Thanks, Sid. Um, John Wariski Jr. Hey, John. Hey, thanks for bringing me up. All right. Appreciate totally. it. Totally. Um, Lindsay, I wrote this in the chat, but I figured I'd just ask you this over, uh, the voice here. I actually, I'm a scout, a location scout. I worked on to all the boys three. Uh, okay. I'm like, I saw that I didn't get to yeah. finish your thing. So go for yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, I worked on cool. the New York unit. Um, I, I, that's my other sort of side hustle. Um, and were you there for the green? Oh, were you there for the band on camera? You know what? I scouted like, you know, the, 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 uh, the Oculus and uh, a few rooftops and you know a bunch of different okay. locations for it, but I wasn't there for the actual uh, production side of things. Okay. I moved on to another job. Um, but yeah, I've I've sort of tried to um, reach out to some music supervisors through the crew lists and just said, you know, hey, I, I work in music too. If, if you might, you know, have any advice or might be able to use um, some music in, in the future. Let's stay in touch. And it, and it's sort of still feels like I'm reaching out from a cold email. So I just didn't know if you had any advice. Um, and, and that's sort of why I'm, I'm taking the course here. Like I'm, I'd like to get a sync agent and, and get in that way too. But um, in the meantime, I've been sort of just trying to reach out to some supervisors that I've worked with and just trying to build a relationship in that sort of way. If you had any advice uh, as to how to open up those sort of emails. Um, yeah, I mean, um... Yeah, these are hard. It's just like we, when you, if you knew how many emails we got, you would understand. You're, you're absolutely right. They are cold. Like, mm -hmm. why should I, you know, respond to your email over something else? Um, it's a tough. And I think some, you'd think like working on the show might give you like an in. Um, but sometimes that's like even weirder, even though it shouldn't be. I'm just trying to give yeah. you like an honest well, perspective. I know, and I totally get it. And and just hearing your perspective on clearing songs, like I would never show a director a location that I haven't fully cleared. Right. 
you know yes. what I mean? So that's, <laughs> I totally get that side of it. And, you know, you go to the furthest extent to make sure you don't go and director scout something and have the director be like, oh, I love this. And then, you know, have the, the location or the song fall through. So anyways, right. just my perspective of it, but. Um, yeah, so yeah. I appreciate that you. Um, so I do think getting a sync agent or, you know, maybe even, maybe you start with someplace like Crucial and then move on to the next thing when you've had some success. Um, they're kind of building blocks. Uh, I mean, here's the other thing, if you're ever on, like if you worked on Virgin River and you had a song that would be perfect in the bar, I'm like, well, I constantly need bar music. And if he's willing to do it for 500 bucks, like why shouldn't we use his music over somebody else's? Sure. Some studios will be like, well, he's already getting paid by the show. He shouldn't yeah. be getting paid two ways by Conflict the show. Conflict of interest. Right. So yeah, just, you know, keep on trying, but yeah, if you, if you can get really specific too, you know, and notice that there's a consistent need on a show, um, it can, maybe that's like the place to get in. Awesome. Sure. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, we're going to take one more. Um, and this I'm going to bring up, um, Jason Slack. Hey, Jason. Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, great. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, thanks for doing this. It's uh, really great. Um, so I just wanted to start with that. But um, I do mostly, actually, I do all electronic music. And I've been doing a lot of, like, covers of, like, old 60s songs and things like that. Um, just kind of wondering your point of view as far as, like, getting and receiving stuff like that or how hard it is to work with covers necessarily when like you don't have all the rights because you didn't write it <laughs> yeah i mean the big thing with covers is like even when it's your version there's a big price tag on it because the publishing's gonna cost something um it might be a good idea to find out who owns the publishing on those covers and make them aware of your versions one it kind of vets it so like if you do ever pitch it you can say oh the publishers heard it before they liked it or whatever, because they might say, no, I, we don't like that cover. But here's the other thing is when I'm looking for covers, I will often say to a publisher, hey, can you send me all your covers of XYZ? Or I'm looking for haunting covers of love songs. Can you send me what you got? Um, so that can be a good place to start. But yeah, covers are sometimes off the table because um, let's just say, Right, I, I would pay you with a thousand dollars, and I would pay Aretha Franklin twenty um, for twenty for publishing you for master. So that's twenty one thousand instead of paying Aretha Franklin forty thousand to use her master. But if I have a scene that only has five thousand dollars or three thousand dollars, I can't even look at covers. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, now, yeah, totally. Now they are also like I have like Virgin River happens to like love covers. So I'm, sometimes I'm like, oh, okay, I'm in cover land. Where are all the covers? Um, but most of my shows, sometimes even a cover puts the song out of the running. Is that how you, um, yeah, Virgin River, you did a, there's a great cover of Landslide, Wonderwall, Elton John, your song. Um, is that how you found them? You went to the publisher and said, hey, do you have uh, covers for this? Or did you, how did you find those? So Wonderwall, that's how I found that cover. Um, okay. The producers found the landslide cover before I was even on the show. Um, mm. it, they found it on YouTube. Um, cool. The Jason Raz cover and your song were actually both Chance Pena. We specifically mm -hmm. wanted covers. Of, we went to artists and said, could you do a cover of this song? Cool. Um, and, or, you know, like, hey, we're looking for covers of this song. Nudge, nudge, get your artist mm -hmm. to record some. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, yeah, there are more covers coming. <laughs> How do you get on the list of the briefs of... of uh, <laughs> oh, to do the covers? <laughs> to do the covers. Well, I mean, to, you know, so Chance is with Secret Road. He's actually managed by Lynn sure. Grossman. So Secret Road's kind of a, they almost always have something for any rate a budget show i'm working on um cool. so they're easy to work with which is awesome mm -hmm. um but then i'm really looking for things very much in the style of the show and then sometimes mm -hmm. we're like oh you know 
uh, they use Simmel a lot to like, go. Oh, we love Simmel. Like maybe we should ask Simmel to do a cover or, gotcha. you know, on Shadow Hunters, Ruel was kind of like the sound of our show. So we would be yeah. like, Ruel, can you write a song for us? Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. So sometimes like the conversations start because the, the show has already used their music. And then, um, and then, yeah, it's me looking for people who I know can do it quickly and aren't going to ask too many questions. Awesome. Weird? Cool. No, no, that makes total sense. Um, cool. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much. This has been so helpful and so informative. Um, I have one final question that I ask everybody who comes on the show, and that is, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? I saw they teased that this was, I was like, what does that even mean? I was like, have <laughs> I made it? I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, I'm sure it's like one of those weird things. I'm like, well, I'm not, you know, Julia Michaels and Julian Jordan. Like I haven't done a star is born. So I haven't quite made it, but then I'm also like, if I am living only work on projects in the young adult world for the rest of my life, like I love it. Um, so I'm grateful. Uh, you know, I, I've literally done nothing else. You know, I got right in with Jenna Madonna when they split up their partnership, I went out on my own. One Tree Hill kept me. So to have a job was amazing. And so I've been really fortunate. And I just, um, I don't know what it is to make it in the new music business. <laughs> I don't know what the definition of making it would be. But uh, I'm grateful to do the job. And I hope to keep doing more exciting things. Awesome. Lindsay Wolfington, thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you.